Hey Cap City Church, thanks for joining us today. We just love that you're part of our online community. And wasn't worship fantastic? I mean, there's nothing better than when the presence of God just fills wherever you are right now, whether you're in your car, in your kitchen, wherever it is. We've been praying for you all week. And I get to close out our series, The Fruitful Life. I get to do the final part of this series, which we've loved. We've loved hearing all the aspects of fruit, the fruit, the mature fruit, the growing fruit, the rooted fruit between Evan and Pastor Dennis. If you missed it, you can go back and listen. But today, I'm gonna to be focusing on um, really what fruit looks like in the fruitful life that is uh, mature-ish. Or like maybe another way of saying that is a term that's kind of trending is adulting. Like what does it mean to be adulting in our fruit? And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit. I'm, I'm aware of the fact that there's some of you watching today that maybe have had no experience with God at all. And then there's others that you've been walking in this for a while. So it may just be a reminder, but it made me start thinking through some of my journey to where I am right now, because it's been over 40 years. And I remember my first moments after I had made a decision to follow Jesus. And we were part of this little tiny Assembly of God church in upstate New York. My husband was a youth pastor and we hadn't quite started dating yet, but I think he was interested because <laughs> he made sure that I got signed up to serve in a number of different areas in the church. And one of them was in the children's program with the second graders. And I remember I, while I had babysat a lot, I wasn't sure quite what to do with all of these kids. And this church bust in kids from all parts of the city. I mean, there were kids that would come in that were a little bit bedraggled, had a really rough life, but church to them was a bright spot. And so, because I wasn't super sure what I was doing, I remember just sitting kind of like in the corner of the room waiting for um, Mrs. D. Armin to, to begin teaching. She was this little four foot tall fireball of a teacher and she just loved those kids with her whole heart. So I'm in the corner because I'm a little bit overwhelmed. And while I'm sitting there, this is like my first day serving, this little girl, she must have been about five years old. Her name was Kimmy. Kimmy was also standing off to the side her hair was dirty, her nose was running, it, it, her, she smelled a little bit, didn't smell like she'd had a bath in a really long time. And I remember just observing her standing in the corner, kind of like I was, and all of a sudden she turned and looked at me and I smiled. And when I smiled, Kimmy came and jumped into my lap and just sat there during the whole class. And to be honest with you, my serving that day was loving Kimmy. And I, in that moment, became a little bit addicted because every week as Kimmy would come back, you could see the transformation in her life as she started learning about Jesus, giving her life to Jesus, and then just being in a loving community. Well, I became addicted. I became addicted to seeing Kimmy's life being changed, the other second graders, and then eventually my friends and family. And, and from that moment of serving, I didn't realize that that serving in that moment was just a seed being planted in the ground in the soil of my life. It wasn't always convenient. I was in college, um, eventually started dating my husband. We got married, but our serving together continued. Uh, when we were in training for ministry, we did everything from my husband doing the plumbing and fixing toilets to me cleaning them. Um, I eventually served our pastor. He was um, single at this point and I took care of him as far as I made sure that his house was clean. There was no job that was too difficult. And one of the reasons that kept us serving in that those early years was first of all, we knew, my husband and I, Pastor Dennis and I knew what God had done in our lives. We also had an inkling of where we would have been if God hadn't come in and touched us. So it kind of infused this desire to serve. But what we were unaware of was in those early days of just sowing seeds of smiling at Kimmy, cleaning toilets, serving my pastor or like everything, cooking, whatever was in front of us to do. And I have to be honest, I didn't always do it with the best attitude, but I did it. What happened in those moments was I was being transformed. I was being changed. I didn't realize they were seeds that God was implanting in me. And then continuing on to when we planted the church and we used to do sidewalk Sunday school where we would take this old big yellow truck that had the platform cut out of the side of it. We'd take it into really the some of the darkest areas in dc and just present jesus and from that to preaching on a platform to having people to our home and so every aspect of serving was a seed that i was even aware of in the process sometimes you just say yes to serve and you don't realize what it does for you personally but i didn't realize it was all training training for where god was taking me and that i was being trained 
in the in the in the process. So one of the things that I want to talk about today is because at Cap City Church, you know, now being back in person, some of you are just online. I just I just want to encourage you that whatever area that we serve in, because we're in a culture right now, it's really important that we pay attention to this because our culture is telling us that we need to self-protect, that we need to be really careful for self-preservation because there's trauma happening everywhere. Pastors talked about it, I've talked about it. Everybody's experiencing PTSD, which, you know, like that's a global thing that's happening because it's so easy to look at your phone, there's another traumatic thing happening. So we want to self-preserve, we want to self-protect. But if we're not careful in this season, we will self-protect and self-preserve us out of the transformation that God has for us in this season. And part of that change and that transformation, I want you to think about this, that in 10 years from now, when you look back at this two year period of time, are you gonna be able to go back to that two year period of time and say, oh my gosh, that was one of the most important seasons of my life. There was trauma all around me, but God transformed me on the inside. Are you going to be able to go back to this two years and actually give an account that where you are in 10 years is significantly impacted because of what God did in the two years? And if we self-protect, self-isolate, then we might miss the moment of what God's doing right now. See, our culture is pulling to us to fit in, but God isn't I don't think God's calling us to fit into the culture. I think God's calling us to stand out in the culture and to be those that are actually a little bit different. God's kingdom is way different than the culture that we're facing. It's an inside out kingdom. We're gonna talk about that a little bit right now. And here's, here's one thing that I, I want you to just think about is you can't drift yourself to a new location. Nobody's ever been in a boat, in a lake, hoping to get to the other side by just drifting. You have to be pretty intentional about where you're going. So when you think about your future, you have to consider what is attached to a fruitful life. You can't just hope it happens and you really can't wait for somebody else to do it for you. There's an intentionality that all of us need in this moment. And the, the deal with COVID and the pandemic is for some of us, it's put us kind of like, it's kind of locked us into this automatic like we're just going to go along and drift and kind of wait for it to pass. Um, and it's kind of in some regards because of the trauma, we just want to be in a comfort zone, but nothing grows in the comfort zone. Everything grows just on the other side of it. So I know that from personal experience, I'll tell you a few more stories as we go on, but I love what it tells us in Colossians two, six and seven. If you have a Bible, you can open it. And if you don't, you can just look on the screen. It says, therefore, as you have received Christ, Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in union with him, reflecting his character in the things that you do and say, living lives that lead others away from sin, which by the way, that's like in every area. I'm not going to preach on that. That's like a whole nother message. But anyways, having deeply rooted in him and now being continually built up in him, becoming increasingly more, you can put in the in the comments line, increasingly more established in your faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with gratitude. So I love, I love this portion of scripture because Paul is writing to the Colossians and he's, he's saying to them, don't forget, like you're in union with Christ and because you're in union with Christ, now you're rooted. And you've heard uh, several different messages over this series about being rooted. Evan's message was phenomenal and on the, what your fruit looks like really is in connection to the proximity to the vine and what you're rooted in. The soil really affects that. Really powerful. But he talks about becoming increasingly more. So your root, where you're rooted establishes how you grow in your faith as you were taught. <clears throat> and then it says this, overflowing with gratitude. So I think probably the foundation of having mature fruit is actually recognizing what Christ has already done with us. Has anybody else, do, does anybody else find it a little bit annoying um, when you meet an adult who has not quite grown up? <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to be playful and have a good time. It's another thing. It's kind of like that movie Failure to Launch um, where the guy was still living in his mom's house. He had never quite gotten to maturity. Like you can't, you're never going to get the full benefits of what God has for your life. The amazing, extraordinary promises, you can, you can quote them till you're blue in the face, but there's a part of growing your fruit that attaches itself to actually seeing what God wants to do. So with gratitude, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for what he's done. I was super messed up. You've heard me tell this 
drinking screwdrivers for breakfast, smoking pot all day long, just crazy relationships that I had. And when I met Jesus, everything began. To, I'm grateful. I have no idea where, to, where I could have been today, maybe not even alive at this point, if I didn't meet Jesus. So I'm grateful because of that. So when I want to grow mature fruit, it's not because I need to make myself pleasing to God. I'm already pleasing to God. I've already accepted him into my life. That I'm already pleasing to him. Mature fruit is because out of gratitude for what he's already done. Okay. So John 15 talks about being rooted. We've talked about this several times and we're going to get into this in just a minute, but I think if we're not careful because of the, you know, because of the past, because of the self-preservation and this desire to just self-protect, if we're not careful, we'll be just, we'll have fruit, but it may just be in seed form or maybe it'll, it won't be mature. Fruit. Is anybody eating it? like um, an avocado that wasn't quite ripe. It's like disgusting. <laughs> so no, we, we, I don't want to stop just shy of mature fruit. I want to live with the maturity that God's called us to. And so I think um, as we move forward, I, I really want to encourage us today to focus on the fruit right now in this moment, in this message, put in the comments line, fruit, focus on the fruit, not the frustration around us, but right now we're just going to focus on growing that fruit. And so I've heard several people say to me that one of the reasons that maybe they're not seeing the growth in their life right now is because they're not being fed the meat. Like maybe, I don't know, Sunday morning, I don't know, right now you have no, we have no excuse, right? We can go anywhere and be fed online. But I've had people say to me, like, I'm not being fed. But, you know, I just want to, I want to remind you, what is it that we're not being fed with? In fact, I love how Jesus talks about how, how he was fed. So he just had this great conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well and his disciples come up to him and they say, you must be starving, it's noon time, let us get you some food. And Jesus says to them, my meat, my food is to do the will of the Father. Okay, well that's pretty extraordinary. So he's just saying, my sustenance, my protein, my strength, everything that I do is to do the will of the Father. I mean, I think that's pretty powerful. Like it better than any Capitol Grill steak, Ruth's Chris steak, better than any 16 layer chocolate cake, which that probably isn't protein, but it's just yummy, right? Any better than any of that. Jesus is saying that my strength, my meat, my feeding comes from just doing the will of the Father. Well, what did the will of the Father look like? Like if we talk about this, what did that look like? So I started thinking about this in, in reading over the last few months and in, in, um, weeks. And in fact, if you get one thing, just one thing out of this message today, I, I want you to understand that probably one of the most important components in growing mature fruit is being intentional on serving and connecting to community. So we're going to get into this in a minute, but just that's like the main thing right now. And in, in a culture that kind of pushes back against that, as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, it's going to be one of the main things that, that we need to walk out. So there's, there's a bit of tension when Jesus talks, when he's talking about what his will is, because his will sounds different depending on who he's talking to. And if you don't like, so for instance, in Luke 18, the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and he asks Jesus, you know, what do I need for eternal life? And he's like, I'm doing all the right things. I'm following the law. And Jesus responds to him in Luke 18, 22, and he says, uh, the one thing that he's missing to grow mature fruit, he's like, you have to sell everything you have. Well, I mean, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big ask. That's, that's huge. Sell everything you have. And so the rich young ruler kind of walks away because that's like a huge commitment, right? But then like right after that, Jesus sees the wee little man. Remember uh, Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was in a tree. Um, if you grew up in church, you remember that nursery, nursery, church, nursery rhyme. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Anyways, it continues on. So he's up in the tree. And so we know, because the story tells us that Zacchaeus was, he was a deceiver. He'd stolen from people. He was not liked by the community. Nobody trusted him. He's like the used car salesman that comes out and just tries to rip you off. That was Zacchaeus. Everybody knows this. So Jesus doesn't say to Zacchaeus, sell everything you have. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner. And then he just hangs out with Zacchaeus and loves on him. And Zacchaeus brings all his, 
all the thugs in town and they're all sitting at the table with Jesus. They're having community, community with Jesus. Not once does Jesus tell Zacchaeus to sell everything because Jesus knows he got this, like the chair Jesus is sitting in was bought with stolen money. Jesus knows this, the food at the table. Well, what does Jesus do? Jesus just loves Zacchaeus. I, it's like, wait a minute, you just told this other guy to sell everything, but not Zacchaeus. But what happens is this grace that Jesus shows Zacchaeus, G Zacchaeus at the end of the meal says to Jesus that I'm pledging to give half my goods to the poor. And he's like, I'm going to give anything I cheated from anybody. I'm going to give them back even more. So this scenario looks a little bit different, but it produces fruit in Zacchaeus that will last a lifetime. It's a story we're still talking about. But then you look at Luke 15, and there's another story. Jesus is with another group of people. He's with the tax collectors and the Pharisees. And they're talking about, you know, um, the, the law. And Jesus begins to tell them this story about the prodigal son. And first of all, he talks about the lost sheep. And he talks about the lost coin. And he talks about the lost son. And so there's this other scenario where Jesus is speaking about the older brother who's judging in the prodigal son story and the younger son who's lost. And it's a completely different story of grace to the people around the table. But then Luke 14, right, right. Just, just before this Luke 14, Jesus speaks to a crowd of people and it's a completely different ask. Jesus says to them, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So he's saying, you need to count the cost to follow me. So it depended on who he was with as to what he was asking. And I just want to say to you today that your level of fruit that you produce and the maturity level it is, is paying attention to what God's asking you for in this moment. So some of us, it's just the grace and the love of God and just the overwhelming grace and love of God right now is going to provoke you to be like Zacchaeus. And you're going to be like, I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. I'm going to, I, there's not, I am so overwhelmed with the love of God in my life right now. That's my response. Others of you, God may be asking you because you've been in this for a while and maybe you've become a little bit numb and God's saying to you, I just want to remind you there's a cost. Some of you, God's saying, I, I need you to pick up your, your cross. I, I need you to go to the next level of commitment. You got kind of comfortable in the grace of God and you kind of have lost the privilege it is for the grace of God that's been on your life. And so God may be speaking to you. I don't know where you are in your journey, but whatever God's speaking to you, first of all, I want to make you aware of that it is an intentionality that puts us in tune with the ask that God is giving us in this season. So if you're new to following Jesus, he may be like soak in my grace and let me work on your heart. To those of you that have been in here for a while, God may be saying, get up off the couch, actually come to church, come to church. It's great, unless you have a strong conviction not to, but if it's just become comfortable to watch church online, come to church. There's nothing greater than being in community. I believe that the maturity of our, and this is like, I love you. I love you so much. I pray for you every day. So I, this is gonna sound strong, but as your pastor, it would be wrong of us to not encourage you to go to the next level in your commitment because we would hate for you to stand in front before Jesus and not have experienced all that he had for you because you didn't realize that it was just staying in tuned with what the ask was in this moment. And we can be so distracted, right? Like even studying for this message, I, you know, I saw a pair of shoes online. I bought them while I'm in the middle of studying for this message. It's crazy. It's so easy to be distracted. But I love how, how Jesus says that his meat, his sustenance, his strength, his growth, everything that he is, is doing the will of the Father. And I, I love how Paul continues this thought later on when he's speaking in 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church. And he says to them, listen, guys, I wanted to give you the meat. I, I really wanted to give you meat, but you've kind of gotten stuck with the milk. And so there's a lot more I want you to experience, but because you're having a hard time digesting the simple things, I can't give you the more complex things. So some of us are saying, God, feed me, feed me. And God's like, I can't. You have to say yes to what I've already asked you to do before I can move you into where I'm taking you. Because, and honestly, it's not just about what we give, it's what he's already waiting to give us in our obedience. So I love this because um, Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter three, and he's, he's like, here, you give me all these excuses why you can't. But he says, we are co-workers with God 
and you are God's cultivated garden, the house he is building. So we are all part of the house God is building who lays a good foundation. Afterward, another craftsman comes and builds on top of it. But we sing is right. We are all co-workers with God building his house. And there's not one gift that's listening to me right now that isn't needed in building. I mean, Jesus could just build it without us, but he's chosen to use us because he knows our transformation is attached. Our fruitfulness is attached to building with him. So all of that to say, our serving, when we when we choose to partner with God and build the house of God together, it the simple practical end of that is just serving. And serving again, you guys know this, it's not position, it's posture. It's not position, it's posture. And so I love this because Jesus really clearly talks about this in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. So you can look at it in your Bible or you can look at it on the screen. But John, they're walking down the road. Jesus has just told the disciples that he's going to be going to the cross. Now, they don't fully understand what's happening, except for they know there's a transition happening soon. And so they are just lowly fishermen. None of them were seen, valued, heard. and None of them had any position until they started following Jesus. Now that they hear there's going to be a change, they're like, okay, so now we have to secure our position because now we've had influence and when he's gone, we may not have it. So it kind of breeze over what Jesus is actually saying. And so James and John, sons of Zebedee, approach Jesus and they say, teacher, will you do us a favor? And he's like, what is it? And they say, we want to sit next to you when you come into your glory. One at your right hand, one at your left hand. Let us secure our position, which also, by the way, is a bit hilarious because Zebedee and John and Peter were in a fishing business together and John and uh, John and James, Jacob is uh, some translations, they pull Jesus aside. So they kind of throw Peter under the bus and they're like, hey, we want to make sure we have the right, we want to make sure we're secure <laughs> in the future if you're not going to be here. And so they whisper to Jesus, they tell him off and Jesus is like, well, let me, let me figure, th I'm not sure what I can do, but then immediately in the middle of this, of course we know Jesus knows what he can do, but he's kind of um, bringing them along in the dialogue. In the middle of all this, the other disciples have heard what these two are doing. And so continuing on in verse 41, now the other 10 disciples overhear this, they become angry and they begin to criticize James and John. They begin to criticize them. Like, does that sound like our culture right now? Anyways, they began to criticize them. And, and when you look this up in the Greek, literally, they are having an all out brawl. They are like yelling at each other. They are so angry in the middle of this. So Jesus gathers all of them and gets them to calm down. And he says, those that are recognized as rulers of the people and those who are in top leadership positions, they rule oppressively over their subjects. But this is not the example you're to follow because I'm telling you an upside down kingdom because all of that culture knew that their influence, their status, everything was based on how they ruled over people. Jesus is flipping it. He says, you're to lead by a different model. If you want to be the greatest, then live as one who's called to serve others. He said the path to promotion, the path to mature fruit, the path to increase, the path to multiplication comes by having the heart of a bond slave or a servant who serves everyone. For even the son of man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve it. Like Jesus is like, listen, I'm not telling you to do something that I don't already do. I came to serve everyone. And I came to give my life as a ransom for the salvation of many. So Jesus is bottom line saying to his disciples, if you want greatness, if you want influence, if you want value, if you want to be known or seen, it's completely opposite of what our culture and his culture was telling them at that point in the culture they were living. Completely different. This is bottom line what Jesus is saying. If serving is beneath you, leadership is above you. If serving is beneath you, maturity, you're never gonna quite get to that place. If serving is beneath you, it, it's never gonna happen. Why? Because what serving does is it actually calibrates our ego. <laughs> It calibrates our ego, calibrates when I want it to be all about me, self-preservation, self-protection, serving calibrates that, puts it back so that I'm not being led by my pride or my ego or my insecurity, but I'm actually being led by what the kingdom principles are, which is serving. So growing mature fruit in the kingdom of God has more to do with posture than position. It has to do more with posture than position. It has to do with obedience. 
And it really means all in. So if we're all sitting at the Cap City Church table today, just like Jesus was telling many of these stories around a table, if we're all sitting at the Cap City Church table, I look around the table and I have seen over almost like 30 years of people sitting at that table. Some still are here, some have moved on, some have moved out of the area. The tables in our area constantly moving and revolving. But if I look at our table right now and I look at the people who have been all in, who have actually lived this kingdom principle of serving everyone, I can just call out a few names of people that have been extraordinary. I mean, we've had many, we have a core group of people that have been amazing. I'm just gonna call out a few. Simone and Emma. Simone has been there from day one when we were in the theater, hard days where we had to, not that it's super easy in the school right now, but she and Emma, Emma's 14, her 14 year old teenage daughter, Emma is a smart mama because she brought Emma to church every week because what's happening in Emma's life is Emma serves with her mom, is Emma's life is being transformed. There's a grit inside of Emma. Emma's being formed and transformed, not just into a servant of God, but God's using her in leadership in many ways. She's gaining confidence in who she is by becoming Coming, like those attributes and character, the fruit of the spirit the pastor's been talking about is growing in Emma's life as a 14 year old and, and Simone. Simone has been part of our setup and tear down team. Like Simone isn't like, like um, she's just a mama and she's pushing those carts. She's putting, she's putting wires away, whether it's in the auditorium, it's in children's church, they are giving their all in. If I look around the table, I see mature fruit at the table by how they're serving. They're not serving because they're trying to please God. They're serving out of gratitude for what he's already done. I look at Gio and Adela. Gio and Adela are serving with their two teenage sons as well. They're there at the crack of dawn when we start set up and they don't, they're like the last ones to leave. They have been a core essential part. Adela serves in Cap Kids. Gio's on the praise and worship team. Their boys are learning, um, I think, screens and light, I don't know. They're all in on every side, all in. If I look around the Cap City Church table, I see extraordinary people. If I look around the Cap City Church table, I see Carmen, who's a grandma. Grandma. This grandma, I'm telling you what, I wouldn't want to meet her in a dark alley because of the, the might of Jesus inside of her. She comes to church with a towel around her neck because she sweats. And you know why she sweats? It's because she's setting up and tearing down Cap, Cap Kids every week. Faithfully, they're setting up and tearing down. And she also leads a life group. And she speaks, she's a mama in her house speaking into people's lives. I look at Brian and Alyssa, who just got married, serving their brains out, Tran uh, like leading life groups. Alyssa's on the worship team. I look at Jamar and Lizzie. Jamar lives in Delaware, for crying out loud, and he comes to church and helps us set up and tear down Lizzie out over outreach, and now they're overseeing Cap, Cap Kids. I'm just telling you right now, those are just a few of the multitude that have been helping us. Small team, but mighty. Multitude, when I say mighty in strength. I wonder where you are around the table. What gifts do you have to offer around the table? And so you may be virtual right now. We have lots of ways you can serve. You'll see a, um, something pop up where you're going to be able to get connected in whatever way you can. But I think posture is everything. And I love going back to Luke chapter 15. And when Jesus was talking about the vine again, he says, my command is this. Super simple, but really hard. <laughs> Love one another as I have loved you. See, in the past, he just flipped this whole thing up. In the past, he would say, love one, an love one another as you love yourself. That was the initial. Love your, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now he switched it up, and it's love one another as I have loved you. He's taken it up a notch. Super easy. No, super hard. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for their friends. Like, I just heard about this story that's extraordinary about this mom who had been... Um, actually, um, their house caught on fire. She was a single mom, I think of three boys. And when she got two of the boys out, she realized one boy was still in the burning house and she ran back in to save him. She burned 60% of her body, third degree burns, and 60% of her body. But she was willing to give her life for that young boy. And that when I think about when Jesus says, greater love has no man than this to lay down one's life, I think about that mom and what Jesus did to give his life for us to save us. So he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command that you love 
each other. So serving really is about loving each other. And I, I love the response. I'm responding because he's already chosen me. He's already chosen me. He's already created me. What did he say? If we continue on, I, I love what the scripture says in Ephesians 2 verses uh, 7 through 10. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work that he does, the good work he's already gotten us ready to do. So you were created for good works. Remember, whatever you give was never yours to begin with. You're just returning to God the gifts and the talents that he, he's already given you. We are transformed in that. So I, to be honest with you, if you were to say, like, give me the mechanics of how you're transformed, I, I don't know. I don't know what the me mechanics are. All I know is that when you give your life to Christ and you uh, give it as an offering, the Holy Spirit comes in and, and the fruit of the Spirit begins to work in us and we become more like Jesus as a community, shoulder to shoulder at the table, building the house of God. I want you to dream with me for a moment. Just dream with me for a moment. What would it look like if you who's watching today or listening today, what would it look like if you were actually all of us, every single one of us, brought our gifts and our talents to the table and actually offered it to God? What could be the impact that we're making in the DC Metro area? Right now we've got a handful of people that are doing 45 different roles on a Sunday or throughout the week. But we have all these ministries that you can get connected to. We have monthly outreaches. We have small groups. Maybe God will ask you to, to actually lead a small group or actually host a small group, a life group. Or perhaps you want to come a little bit early and help us set up and tear down or, or just be a smiling face in the lobby. Or we need more hosts online. So maybe you're willing to, to connect to that. Listen, I'm telling you that where God is taking you, he cannot take you without the surrender and the obedience to actually serve because that's what produces the mature fruit. I love the story, and I'm closing with this, the story of the talents that tells us a story about this landowner who goes away and he gives talents to three people. He gives five talents to one, three talents to another, and one talent to the third. So he gives them something. Everybody's given a measure. Everybody's given something. I always felt like I was only given one, but it doesn't matter how much you've been given. Everybody's been given something. We, we call it talents, oftentimes it's translated money, but we've all been given a T. We've all been given a T. That could be time, talent, maybe you have an understanding of technology. Um, it could be anything that God's given you. You may even feel like it's insignificant. You may even feel like it's nothing, but God's given you something. He created you with that. And then I love the story it tells us that the guy who has the five talents, his ability, he actually invests it and it produces more, it multiplies. The guy who had three talents, he invests it, uses it, serves with it, and actually that multiplies. And then the guy who had one talent didn't feel like it was enough, so he hid it. He hid his T. He hid it in the ground. And so when the, the man comes back, when the landowner comes back, he's like, wait a minute, you, you had the opportunity, the first two is like, well done, good and faithful servant. You took what I gave you and you invested it, used it, and it multiplied. But to the one, He's like, it's a pretty strong term. He's like, going to outer darkness. He said, you're, you're like wicked because you didn't use it. So I'm not gonna say that to you today. But what I'm saying is don't rob yourself. Don't rob the church, Cap City Church, or the extended community that has still yet to find Jesus by burying the tea that God's given you. By keeping it hidden and missing the moment of actually God using it. Mature fruit, directly connected to how you hear what God, Jesus is asking you to do. Some of you, it may be the grace of God and you're overwhelmed. Wait a minute, what you've done for me is incredible. I can't hold it back like Zacchaeus. I wanna give more. It may be he's saying, pick up your cross. Come on, we're gonna move forward in this next season. Time to get up and rise up. Time to stop sitting back. Time to move forward, right? So I don't know what next year is gonna look like. All I know is that our hearts desires that you grow to the fullest and see the multiplication of what God has for your life. So I'm gonna pray. And maybe you're here today and you've made it this far along and you, you just kind of, your walk with God has just become a little bit mediocre and you wanna make a fresh new commitment to God. I'm gonna pray with you. And perhaps in here that's connected, whatever the decision is, I believe there's some of you watching, the connection and the decision is, you know what? I'm not gonna sit back any longer. I'm rising up. I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna put skin in the game. I wanna invest and building what God's doing in the DC metro area by connecting to Cap City Church. Let's go ahead and pray. So God, in the name of Jesus, 
Thank you for those that are watching today. And so today, Lord, whether it's a fresh new commitment to serve you or whether, whether it's a fresh new commitment for a relationship with you, or we're just like, wait a minute, I haven't, I've been so distracted. I haven't been hearing what you've been saying, but today, Lord, I'm committing, I'm making a fresh new commitment in Jesus name. And so, Lord, I ask you to bless those commitments. And as we surrender to you, I thank you that this next step can't get washed over by the business of the week, but that you remind us daily of what we've committed to today. Thank you, God. 2,000 years ago, you died on the cross. And because you died on the cross, our response to that is thank you. Help us to walk this out. Give us a hope and a future. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Next week, we start a new series. Can't wait to see you.